let's let's get the show on the road. Uh, hi, my name is John Vance, uh, president uh, with Vance Wealth. Um, thanks for joining us today uh, for our uh, quarter, or sorry, our monthly advanced perspective webinar. And uh, today we're going to just do a kind of a current market update, uh, address some of the tax issues that we're seeing, and uh, I have a PowerPoint that we'll go through, obviously. Uh, real quick, from a housekeeping perspective, um, the you have the ability to do questions and answers. What I would really encourage you is I'll, I'll likely at the very end go through them. So as you're thinking them, as I may be going through something, if you want to ask questions, please do so. Uh, and we'll go through and at the end, go through the questions. If we get too many, then what we'll likely do is make note of them and reach out to you individually. So, um, you know, I would prefer to do this in person so that I could see all your faces and, and be able to answer questions live. But you know, we're still in a, a webinar world, uh, but I'm glad you could all join me from wherever you're tuning in. So I'm going to go ahead and, and get started here with, with getting the PowerPoint going. Let's see. I already got some questions that says turn up the microphone. So I'm just going to speak louder and hopefully that will work. Um, so I apologize. Let you guys can let my team know if I'm still not loud enough, um, but I, this will, I'll, I will definitely speak louder. Okay. Okay. So current market update. Uh, here's obviously some of our disclosures. Vance Wealth is a registered investment advisor. And this is our, you know, the, the uh, opinions today are the opinions of myself and our company Vance Wealth. Um, and just as another housekeeping thing, just so that you know, um, we will be sharing this video with you um, and we'll also uh, give you access to the PowerPoint if you would like. All right, so the updated tax proposals, we're a little bit farther along in the process. I gave a webinar back in June and we were, it was still just initially just the Biden administration tax proposals. And we kind of suspected that, you know, when you start with a fairly massive change in the tax code that you're going to pretty much throw everything out there, which is really what we've seen. And now that the House has gotten a hold of it and made some adjustments, uh, it's kind of simplified the tax bill down. Uh, it, it hasn't been fully passed and it's obviously not signed, but we do think that's going to be happening in the next few weeks, uh, barring any, uh, any last minute fighting, but it looks like we're getting closer to these changes. Uh, and so now the tax proposal obviously started with, with the Biden administration and now has the spin of the rest of Congress to put together a package that's going to work uh, from a bill perspective. So what I'm going to cover, I'm not covering all the pieces of the changes. And one of the reasons I'm not doing that is because we still have a bit of uncertainty around what's going to be in the final bill. And, but mainly what I want to do is cover what it looks like is going to get passed and primarily the impact on you as individual filers. I have a little bit in here on some of the corporate tax changes, uh, which I can allude to, uh, but mainly I wanna focus on uh, what we're looking uh, at in terms of how your taxes might be impacted. Hey, John. Depending. Yes. Can you, can you share your screen? Yes. Thank you. I, you figure I'd be a pro by now, so. Uh, all right, sorry about that, everyone. All right, so what we're looking at here from a uh, from the, the 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 high level of changes, we're looking at first income and capital gains tax changes. So basically, what the proposal is going to look like is that single filers with income below four hundred thousand uh, and married filing jointly with income below four hundred fifty thousand will probably not see much in the way of an impact on their taxes. And you know that's the majority of Americans. Uh, for our client base, a little bit of a mixed bag uh, because we do uh, have you know, those that are in, in much higher income brackets. Uh, and so especially you know, those that are still working. Uh, and so that's one of the things that looks like there's not gonna be a lot of changes, at least on the income tax perspective. Um, the, the big changes that we're seeing are in those areas above those thresholds. So 400,000 and 450 are really the key areas. And then if you notice here on the screen, it looks like we're gonna be bringing back the 39.6 marginal bracket. Uh, that's what was in place through the Obama administration, most of the Bush administration. 
And the, but the other thing that's a little bit of the devil's in the, in the detail is that the 30, there was a 32, there is a 32 and a 35% tax bracket that went much higher and those are going to come down. So even if you're not in the highest tax bracket, uh, if you're above these thresholds of 400 and 450, you're likely going to see some tax changes, even if you're not at the highest. Um, the other thing that's look like, looking like it's going to change again at the same threshold levels is that capital gains will increase. The highest capital gains rate right now is 20%. Uh, and the their proposal looks like it's going to be at 25%. Now, while this is displeasing to investors, uh, remember initially the Biden tax proposal had talked, uh, talked about pushing that up to 39.6%. So you know, in essence, what we're looking at is that the, uh, the capital gains rate is going up by about 25% versus initially they talked about it going up uh, by almost 100%, because if you look at the, the math on, on, on those increases. And so, um, but for the majority of Americans, again, under these brackets, uh, the tax, you know, capital gains will remain at the 15% level. Okay, so we are gonna get into the weeds a little bit on some of the, uh, some of the areas where I know we've been spending a fair amount of time with you as clients and helping you make decisions around funding Roth IRAs, funding Roth conversions, so there, there is this strategy that's in place. We've been utilizing it to get more of our money in Roth IRAs. Just real simply, if you remember a Roth IRA is an account, when you fund it, you don't get any tax deduction. Uh, so you fund it with post-tax dollars. And then when you take money out, all of the gains, capital gains, interest, anything you earned over the years, it comes out of the, um, it comes out of the account completely tax-free. So if you're making higher income levels, there, you, you actually aren't eligible to fund a Roth IRA. Um, and so there was, a, there was a strategy called a backdoor Roth IRA that allowed you to get money into a Roth IRA uh, using the tax code. And that looks like that's going to go away next year in 2022. Uh, the same goes for what's called a mega backdoor Roth. Not many people know about that in four, inside 401ks. The other thing too, which is a, a technique or a plan we've been utilizing quite a bit for the last five years, is utilizing Roth IRA conversions, where we're moving money from IRAs to Roths to take advantage of some of that long-term tax benefit. Looks like this is gonna start phasing out in 2031. So that certainly will have an impact on some of our planning. It's not a here and now item, but it's shortly. All right. I'm just checking my questions here. So it looks like I'm okay. I wanna make sure you guys can all see me and hear me, so. Um, the next slide we're going to go through is estate taxes. So this has been a hot topic. Uh, the estate tax tax liability, or I should say the estate tax tax exemption um, for individuals in 2021 was at 11.7 million, which means as a single person, if your estate is below 11.7 million, you are not going to have to pay any estate taxes when you die and pass this on to your children. So the proposal is looks like it's going to get cut in half to 6 million. Now, that's a little bit more in line with what it was during the Obama administration, uh, where during his presidency, it, it moved from, I think, 2 million to 5. My data might be off a little bit, but we're, we settled in at 6, which, again, that's not going to snare a lot of taxpayers. I mean, in California, um, clearly with our real estate prices and the you know, value of IRAs, things like that, this is certainly going to hit a lot of our clients um, from an estate tax perspective, but it looks like this is what this number is going to be, is settling in around 6. And if you are married, then you, you double this, this exemption. So, it, it, uh, so this looks like what's going to pass. Again, not for sure, but this looks like what the, the, the bill that the House is okay moving forward. Um, there's also some little known things. So this is kind of for your biz, uh, business owners uh, that are watching. Um, there's something in the tax code called net investment income tax. And net investment income tax is basically a tax that you pay on investment income. So that would be through like real estate. It could be for, from dividends. It could be from some capital gains. And that only applied to investment income. They are now looking like they're going to pass this where if you're an S corporation, even though you're actively working in that business and it's technically not investment income, um, that they'll, they'll basically apply this 3.8% for distributions that get you above those thresholds of 400 to, uh, to 500,000, right? So those are the thresholds we're looking like. There's also part of the tax code that um, business owners had uh, this, what's called a QBI deduction, which is qualified business income deduction. And this looks like they're gonna phase this out for high income taxpayers, which is not great for our, our business owners that are high earners and we're utilizing this deduction because it was pretty extensive. 
And um, that's definitely going to leave an impact on, on, on most businesses. And, you know, most what we call small businesses, which would be businesses under like 500 employees, uh, they are set up as an S corporation versus like a C corporation. And so um, th this is definitely going to have an impact uh, on many of these business owners. Um, the, the last thing that um, we'll, we'll cover is kind of two things here. So you see, I have Jeff Bezos uh, on the screen. They're, they are putting in place, at least in the proposal, is a high net worth tax. And so they're looking at adding a 3% federal income tax surcharge on taxable income above $5 million. So basically up to $5 million, it's the normal tax rate. And then you pay a surcharge on anything above that. And I think that's really to deal with, if you remember during the, the last, actually, to be honest, the last couple elections, they've talked about having this idea of like a wealth tax, right? Where you would tax, uh, you would tax net worth, you would tax if you have too much, you know, real estate stocks. And I think this was a, a potentially negotiation where they said, okay, well, if we're not going to tax somebody's wealth. Let's at least tax them at a higher rate. Um, and above 5 million, I, I believe that number is less than 0.1%. It might be like 0.01% of Americans make over 5 million. So pretty small number, probably not going to generate a lot of tax revenue. So obviously way much more political to make sure they're taxing the, the higher earners, which, which was to be expected, right? So um, the other thing, and this is a little bit of a nuance in how the code works, but you know, there are some individuals that decide when they're going to leave their IRA to their beneficiaries that instead of leaving it directly to children, they leave it to a trust. And so one of the challenges there is that this higher bracket will apply to trusts only at 100,000 of income. So there's gonna be some need to make sure estate plans are up to date uh, so that if you accidentally or maybe on purpose name a trust instead of your individual child or individual children that you don't unintentionally create this additional tax. Um, more to stay tuned, you know, more to uh, learn about this. I haven't seen this in other drafts. Uh, so obviously this was very specific um, to uh, the House bill because I did not see it prior, or at least it wasn't talked about it uh, before. Um, the last thing that I don't have a slide for, there are a bunch of corporate tax reforms really going after the larger companies. There's taxes on international income. There's, uh, they're looking like they're going to change they're going to move the, uh, the lower tax rate on, on corporations to slightly higher. I think going from like 20% back to 25 or 26. And again, that's, that's going to, it doesn't have an impact on, I guess, the, the rank and file, except for the, the fact that, and I, I say that a little tongue in cheek, because there is this tax theory that, right, if you tax corporations, that's less money in their pocket. So they have to pass that on to consumers, right? So it depends on how you look at that. But with the, 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 with the corporate taxes going up, Presumably, some of that's going to hit consumers, right, based on the products they buy. And then also, with tax rates going up, that will lower the earnings for stocks. So that clearly has an impact on all of us, right? So, um, so with, with some of these higher corporate taxes, we're likely to see a drop in earnings, just like we saw the, the, the bounce when uh, during the Trump tax changes, the, the, the lower tax rates helped to drive some of the earnings of many of our companies. And so, um, so, there, is, so there is obviously impact throughout uh, we all know, as we've seen different bills, if you guys remember the, the health care bill that was written, uh, the Affordable Care Act, it was like 1,800, 2,000 pages of a bill. I don't know how big this thing's going to be, but there's going to be a lot of stuff in there because remember, this is not only a, there's not only a revenue side of this, there's a spending side of that, right? So there's actually the, where's the, where's the money going? And that's where we're going to spend a little bit of time. I'm going to just do a quick, quick check in on my Q&A make sure I'm not having any technical difficulties. All right, perfect. So one question that I got that I'll just answer live real quick is um, those numbers that I'm giving you, the 400,000 and 450, I believe those are going to be taxable incomes, not adjusted gross income, but I'm not 100% sure. But I, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain they're based on taxable income, which means after deductions. Okay, so we talked about the tax piece, right? So now the question is, well, where's what are we doing with the money, right? So the big part of this bill, obviously with us being in COVID for over 18 months and still, you know, we have more on the horizon. Um, the whole idea is we got to build America back stronger. We have to invest in infrastructure to kind of get us ready for the, the next economic boom. And so we have a lot of policies in place 
the original bill was is, is a 3.5 million package. And this actually was a piece that came directly out of Raymond James. They think the bill is going to settle into around two to two and a half million, or excuse me, two to two and a half trillion dollars. That's likely going to be what this, what the final bill will look like. And I'm not going to read through the entire slide on here, but you know, the areas where the money is going to be going into is we do have housing assistance. Uh, we have research and development. There's a big part of this as for energy and climate change uh, in terms of, you know, basically modernizing our, our, our energy system nationwide. Uh, but the biggest part by far is the health and labor. So I'm going to read this is like the fifth paragraph down. So it looks like of this, there's a $2.5 trillion allocation. Uh, this is for things like paid family and medical leave for enhanced child tax credits uh, for families, um, long-term care for seniors uh, and persons with disability, having universal pre-K for three and four-year-olds, tuition-free community colleges, uh, school infrastructure investments. So that's actually the biggest lion's share of this is the health and labor. Um, but again, this will, get, this will likely get shrunk down a little bit um, but it's still going to be a, a massive spending bill, which is really, and they can't spend all this money in one year. So this is going to be out over the next 10 years, I believe is the estimate. Um, and in the bottom right, you can see, so what we're looking like is this infrastructure bill paired with the, the tax related issues is we're likely going to see anywhere from zero, which is unlikely, but some, you know, $500 billion of deficit spending um, to basically fund the, to fund these, which obviously builds our deficit, uh, which is already uh, quite large over $30 trillion. So hopefully that give you a little bit of sense of some of the areas that we're, we're, we're looking at here. And we're gonna have clarity on this soon. Um, and so we won't be wondering, my next webinar might just be, okay, this is the final, let's talk about what this means for the economy. So let's talk a little bit about what this means for Biden, I guess what this what, what, what this is meant for Biden's approval ranking over the last uh, over the last several months. But you can see on the uh, I, we're going to go through a few of these charts, a uh, few of these pages that have basically three charts, and I'm going to work my way from left to right. Um, and so what we're looking at on the far left hand side is the Biden approval rating. It's now underwater. Um, and you can see how that has changed over the last basically since January one. Um, and then if you look at the middle one, uh, the middle chart basically shows what are, what's the likelihood of, you know, having the, uh, the, you know, the party in power win, you know, the midterm elections. And so you can see the dotted line going down the middle, there's Biden's approval rating. And when other presidents have been in that same area, they've likely lost seats. And so if you look at this chart, this basically on the left-hand side, you can see towards the top, it has a zero line. So zero meaning the, 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 uh, the Democrat party would not be gaining any seats. And if you're below that, that means you're losing seats. And so you can see historically when you have the approval rating of a president, you can see they've lost seats. And the best case scenario on that similar line is about a 10, 10, uh, 10 seats that were lost. And in some cases it was as big as 60 when you look at that. And so that's likely what we're seeing is gonna be pro uh, projected, but you know, a lot can happen. And then on the far right, it kind of shows the likelihood of what's going to happen with the House and the Senate. Uh, the, the idea of what this is what they call the betting markets, because there's actually markets out there you can bet on the results of the election, is that the, you know, the, the betting markets are basically predicting that both the House and the Senate will flip to con, uh, Republican control, which is significant because if that does happen, these big cha uh, tax changes, spending changes are hard to move forward when you don't have the, the majority as the Democrats have right now. And so that's one of the things that is really important I for the Biden administration is to get this done with in case the midterm uh, things do flip based on where we're seeing the numbers today. Um, so that gives you a little bit of sense of kind of what's happening from a political perspective. Um, the one of the questions we'd be getting a fair amount of, and you know, some of you might even be a little bit more nervous about what's happening the, around the world. Clearly what's happening with Afghanistan, what we're seeing on our border. I mean, we're seeing a lot of things where we're seeing a lot more noise uh, on the news and, and, and not good things, right? So I think investors are getting nervous about, are we gonna have a pullback? Is my, is my account gonna go down? Things of that nature. So I do wanna spend a little time talking about that because this concept of, are we overdue for a pullback? Well, historically we are. Um, and you know, one of the things that you all know from me is, you know, we focus on being long-term investors because 
you know, while the noise we're seeing today is different than in the past, it tends to repeat itself in different and manifest itself in different ways. And so um, this type of uh, geopolitical issues, these types of tax issues that, that you know, COVID is certainly new. Um, you know, we haven't had a, this type of a pandemic going back, you know, 100 years. Uh, but, you know, these types of things happen on a global scale. And so, you know, when we start talking about stock market volatility. That's just a normal part of investing. So we're going to go through some of the data about are we overdue for a pullback? And then I'm going to just share a little bit of long term perspective to hopefully put your mind at ease. But, you know, you can be the judge of that. And I know as we go into year end, many of us are going to be having meetings going into our year end uh, meetings might be tax focused. It might be investment focused, but those things will be on the horizon as you start meeting with one of your advisors here at Vance Wealth. So let's go through some of these charts, because when you look at them, it looks noisy. Uh, hopefully you're not looking at too small of a screen. Certainly if you're on your phone, this will be a little bit challenging. Uh, so it is abnormal how long this, re this basically recovery has, has gone on. Uh, so it's been 217 trading days since the previous pullback. And we say the previous pullback is a pullback of 5%. So we have 217 days. Now, in the last few days, that 5% might have been breached. Just as I was preparing for this, we had a lot of volatility yesterday. I still think we haven't breached that 5%. I mean, we might be at three and a half, maybe four. Um, so the short answer is yes, we're due, overdue for, for a pullback. Um, and if you look at some of these charts, the left-hand chart is, shows us that we've been living through this, basically the strongest bull market at this juncture, meaning the number of days we've seen recovery since the bottom of COVID going back to last April, or sorry, March, April, uh, we've seen this recovery that's been stronger than any. And we know the reason why is we've been fueled by a lot of spending, a lot of stimulus, a lot of things to get us back on track. Uh, and there are plenty of industries, especially in the technology and healthcare that are thriving in this environment, real estate market thriving in this environment, right? So we've seen the strongest bull market at this time, uh, basically, uh, you know, I don't know if I can say in history, but, you know, going back over the last at least 70 years. Um, and you can see the length of time since the late last pullback, which is the middle chart shows we're at 217. And then historically, they don't last this long, right? It's normal to have volatility. We've all been accustomed to volatility. That's a normal part of investing, but it's been really quiet. And it's quiet because of the things that I mentioned, all the stimulus, and then also the Federal Reserve has been keeping interest rates really low. And then this then shows in the far right, the S&P 500 experiences three to five, excuse me, three to four, 5% pullbacks on average every year. That's the average. And you can see periods like 2000, where that number was up to eight. Um, and then, you know, more recently, last year, we had five, right? So that's the normal. So the fact that we haven't had one yet, but again, we might be in this week where uh, we're tec technically going to breach that. Um, it just, it's just, it's a, uh, we, so short answer is we are overdue, but that doesn't mean we're going to pull back. Uh, just because we're overdue, things can go on longer than any of us expect. So, and that's one of the reasons why you focus on the long term, because a lot of the short term, no, uh, the short term noise you can't control it you, and it's really hard to predict it. And so when you start deviating from your long-term strategy, it just derails um, any sense of having, you know, long-term strategy or long-term discipline with investing. So this kind of deals with a little bit more of the concepts around the pullbacks. So, um, you know, when we look at when pullbacks occur, what's the magnitude of them? And, you know, how, how, big, how big are these pullbacks? And so, you know, if you look back over, you know, the most recent history on the left-hand side, you can see when we have pullbacks, what's the magnitude of the decline? So we have a couple, we have basically three bar charts here, five to 10%, 10 to 20 and 20 plus. And, you know, I don't see the date on here to see what the time frame is on this. Uh, but my guess is this is going back about 70 years, but I might be off on that. So, but you can look at the pullbacks and you can see, so we've had 20% uh, plus declines five times. So this must be about a 20 year time frame. Uh, and maybe I'm just missing this on the screen, but I don't see it. Yeah. And then you can see the more normal corrections are five to 10%, right? That's happened 58 times. So the big declines, I think, are what keep us up at night, uh, but they don't happen as, as frequently, clearly, uh, like the five to 10%. So smaller pullbacks are more common. That's kind of what we're expecting. Um, you know, and one of the reasons why small pullbacks shouldn't bother you is when you look at the middle chart here, it shows the, the number of months to recovery. So that basically means when you have a pullback, how long historically does it take you to, to earn back those losses? And on a five to 10% uh, decline, 
typically it's only two months, right? So we can weather that. That's not, a, that's not very painful. Uh, and then on a 10 to 20% decline, now the recovery time is five months, right? A lot longer. And then this is obviously what makes investors nervous is when you have a 20% decline, it takes 53 months to recover. So, you know, we're looking at uh, over, uh, over four years in that case. So one of the reasons why we look at a pullback is we, we do think a pullback is going to occur. Um, and because we know that's normal, uh, but when you start looking at why we think it's going to be limited and we're going to continue to move forward is we still have a strong economic environment. There's a lot of stimulus and tax and, uh, and uh, interest rates, uh, low interest rates that are, that are fueling the, the economy. We're having uh, an increase in vaccinations globally, right? That'll help open things back up. Um, we still are seeing a lot of shareholder friendly activity uh, just in terms of, you know, what companies are doing. Uh, earnings growth is still really strong. And the last piece is don't forget, we have very attractive valuations against bonds and cash, right? Because cash is paying very little, bonds are paying very little. So the uh, risk reward trade-off on stocks still looks pretty healthy, which is one of the reasons why we think a uh, potential pullback would be uh, limited. All right. So I just have a pullback theme today on, uh, uh, on, uh, on this topic, but you know, I, it's actually kind of fitting because yesterday was a pretty volatile day. Uh, so when you start looking at, you know, trying to, I think the ideal investor would say, if I could just miss these pullbacks, I'd be so much happier. Well, the reality is you not only have to get out at the right time, you got to get back in on the right time. And it's just, it's, it's impossible to do that. Cause clearly if we had the ability to, we would do that because we would make you more money. But there's just no repeatable way of doing that. And, you know, people like Warren Buffett, most successful investor, investor of our time, takes this long term approach, as, as do we. So if you look at this chart, uh, it's fairly easy to kind of read and understand. This is a 20 year chart. And basically, this shows kind of the danger or the folly of stock market timing when an investor like panics during volatility because things are painful, right? Because they're, there's actually they're losing uh, money. But you can see, you know, performance, if you miss the, be you know, the best days, um, you know, the last, basically, if you were invested the whole time, you earned the highest return. And if you miss the best 20 days, you can see you had a negative return. And what we're looking at the chart, which I think is a good reminder that the best days and the worst days usually come together. So if you're able to see on this chart, I do know it's a little bit small, but you have these pockets where the markets have gone down and there's a lot of red, there's red along the way. That means these are the part of the 20 worst days over the last 20 years. But then if you notice on the recovery, the 20 best days also factor into that. So we saw that back in 2007 to 2008 decline. And we saw that during COVID because we, know, we knew how steep the beginning decline in COVID was and then how quickly the recovery is as exhibited here on the chart. So it's just a reminder that the best days and the worst days are, are, are batched together. And you have to have some faith that over time, this will work itself out. So uh, hopefully some of these charts are a little bit helpful. Now, one of the inter interesting things coming out of... Um, some research uh, that you know Raymond James has put together. They are they're comparing. There's some similarities between 2013 and 2021. Now, in 2013, the stock market ended the year up 31 percent. Now, I'm no by no means predicting that, but that's how good the stock market was in 2013. So, what we're looking at here is on the left hand side is kind of stacking up all the economic and global related issues that we're seeing. And then on the right hand side shows a chart overlaid. It shows the 2021, which is a light blue chart uh, against uh, 2013. And it shows kind of this trend of where things are heading and how there's some similarities. And if you actually look at the um, what we're seeing from uh, the Federal Reserve, we had we had, you know, we had a Fed tapering plan. We had, you know, you can see on their Bernanke replacement, Powell reappointment or replacement. Um, we had the time where in Syria, red line crossed, Afghan Afghanistan withdrawal, government shutdown, right? We had a debt ceiling issue that we faced back in 2013. We're facing the same thing now. Um, we're, and so we had the government shutdown, which is, is related to the debt ceiling, right? Because if you, if you can't take on more debt, you can't run the government. Um, you can see the, the uh, uh, reconciliation package. And then I'm, I'm not sure the reference on the German election, but Nonetheless, I guess that happened in the in the in these two years, and so you know we do think we're going to start seeing some volatility as we go into year end. But you know we've been pretty adamant that we thought this recovery was going to be strong. 
Uh, and while I know politically things are really heated, uh, we, we still don't think that's gonna get disrupted by this. Even though, to be honest, watching the news is maddening no matter what channel I go on. So it is getting a little fatiguing. So I definitely enjoy the economic pieces of all this because it's uh, far more optimistic than the, what we're seeing in the rest of the, the news. Okay, so this probably looks like an odd slide coming into just coming out a lot of that heavy data, but you know, I, was re I read a really good article today that I just wanted to share, um, and I had my whole team read it, just share with you some concepts. And so when you think about investing, and, and I, I know these are kind of powerful words, but when you start thinking about how to be a good long-term investor, you, know, you, you really have to have these, these three characteristics, or you have to abide by these three uh, ideologies. And number one is faith, right? You have to have faith that over time, you know, especially here in the U.S., that our economy is going to continue to mature. It's going to continue to move forward. Businesses are going to continue to innovate. You have to have faith in the system that over time, the economy grows and expands. And we do. And, and, and that's a key tenant because when things get shaken, we, don't, we, we know it's temporary. We know we'll make our way out of this. So that's number one. Number two is patience. When we're looking at being a long-term investor, um, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of times where things aren't working in your favor and just having patience to ride through, stay the course is a critical characteristic. People who can't have patience that feel like they have to invest in the hot idea of the day, um, that's where they, they, they get into trouble. And then the last piece is discipline. You know, We see too often people sell at the wrong time. They don't have discipline and a lot of it is because they don't have faith in patience. And so the lack of discipline is where people get in trouble with investing because they just don't stay the course. They don't have a process that they follow. And hopefully that's why you hire advanced wealth is to, to kind of navigate through this because you know, you're, most of you are investors for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, right? So we are talking about a long time frame uh, where you want to have faith, patience, and discipline. So what I do want to share with you is uh, just some in interesting numbers. So I probably should have parched out a little bit of this. And so it's not, there's not so many words, but it's, this is a really important message. And so the title of this is, what if I had invested at exactly the wrong time? And the reason why this is relevant is as of a few days ago, we were hitting all time highs on the market. And we have constant conversations with clients that are saving money, that have new money. They're like, oh, is this a good time to send it? And, you know, in our a little bit tongue in cheek kind of quick answer is it's always a good time to invest. And so what this is designed to show to, to, uh, to illustrate is what if you had actually pick the exactly worst and wrong time, if it was the worst time to invest. And so let me walk you through this because we lived through this. I lived through this as an advisor and we lived through this. And so from the beginning of 1926 through the end of 2020, right? So we're looking at almost 100 years, the average annual compound return of the S&P 500 index was slightly in excess of 10%. Now, real quick on a disclosure, you can't invest directly in the index, but you can invest in a product that tracks the index. But we all know some of these long-term results for the markets. So over this 100-year period, it's averaged about 10%. The next bullet point, the single worst day to invest in the S&P since the end of world, uh, the Second World War was Tuesday, October 9th, 2007. That was the single worst day. If you'd invested on that day, then the net effect of, of this was basically the S&P um, 17 months later on March 9th of 2009, it had declined 57%, right? And that's the big fear of an investor is I have this big loss. And it frightens all investors, uh, even those that have faith, um, patience, and discipline. So you can't hide from that. That's a that's a scary time when you saw that when we saw when we lived through that level of decline. So what if I had invested all my money at that day? Literally, you just started investing, and said I'm gonna put all my money in the S and P 500, and you picked the worst day and just held it. Do you know what the the average average annual return since then would have been? Basically, up till today, or probably the end of this uh, of last month was 10%. So even with that loss, uh, that loss initially, you still have averaged 10% looking back over the last 14 years or so. So if you basically made your only investment in the S&P and it took place on that single day, it did take six years to get back to even. And that's the painful part. That's the patience. 
um, and only eight more years to get back to long-term averages. And right, so we're looking at a window where it was really painful. And the reason why I wanted to mention this now is I don't think we're there, but we could be, right? We could have that. And, and I do think we have more room to run, but nobody has a crystal ball. And that's why we diversify. We're not investing just in the S&P, uh, but this is a reality of when you have, when you have that time horizon, and I know so, many of you on this call, because I checked the names, um, you're retired and you say, well, I don't have that. I don't have this time. And I would argue with you on that because if you're 70 and you're going to be on this planet to, let's say, at least 90, you have 20 years. This was a 14 year time frame. You do have time. So um, and that's one of the things that's just really important to understand. And and also the money you're not going to spend during your lifetime is going to go on to that next generation. And clearly it's better to earn a higher rate of return over time versus, you know, what we're seeing in, in especially in cash. And my last kind of, I guess, words of wisdom on here is being, succe uh, being successful, being a successful lifetime investor takes patience and it truly does. So hopefully that just uh, shed a little light on just some of our thoughts right now and, and also reason why it's really important to have this long-term uh, mindset. So I'm not going to read all this to you, but you know, one of the things as a firm, you know, one of our core values is committed to continuous growth. Uh, many of you have known our, our office continues to grow. We doubled our office size during COVID. Uh, we've continued to hire and build a stronger team. And at the end of the day, the reason we do that is we can serve more people, help more families like you. Um, so, you know, one of the things is if you know anyone who you think would benefit from meeting with us, please connect us. Uh, and, you know, we don't charge for the consultation. We'd love to have an opportunity to help them. We know there's a lot of change going on. We hope, hopefully, the reason you tune into our webinars on a, on a monthly basis is you value uh, our advice. And so just know we are here to help. Uh, and, you know, I'm really excited to, to have our growing team. Uh, we just hired somebody that will be starting in a few weeks, which puts us up to 14. So thank you for all your, your commitment over the years. Uh, one quick thing, most of you are going to be scheduling meetings, but if you happen to be a guest on, on this, uh, not a client, um, you can go ahead and uh, click on the, this QR code, or you can... Um, basically go on to our website and book an appointment. So just as a, a mark your calendar, and I know hopefully we've been pretty good about getting uh, calendar invites out, but our next webinar is October 19th, and it's at 4.30 as always, Pacific time. And all right, we are on to questions. So I'm gonna go take a look here and see what we have. So bear with me, because I wanna make sure, um, I gotta make sure I have appropriate questions first of all, uh, but then I wanna make sure I can make sense of them. So. Um, one question is, uh, when China sneezes, uh, does the rest, uh, does the rest of the world catch a cold? Well, in essence, I mean, you think about the size of the Chinese economy, right? They're second to our country, uh, and the amount of uh, production that they have, the amount of, uh, consumption they have, it's just because of their sheer size. Yeah. When China's having challenges, it, it can cause uh, pain around, around the world, right? So, um, Fortunately, the U.S. can weather a lot of that, but you know we're certainly seeing challenges. If you know anyone who imports or or uh, manufactures overseas and is trying to get goods in here, we're having challenges, right? And a lot of that is kind of driven by China. But so at the end of the day, I would say yes. If the U.S. catches a cold or if China catches a cold, um, or sorry, sneezes, then the rest of the world could catch a cold. I would agree with that statement. The one thing that we have to our advantage is we have a you know a a, we have fiscal policy, red, uh, you know, and, and we have monetary policy. So fiscal policy, U.S. government, fiscal policy is our Federal Reserve Board, and that's probably more powerful than anything that China can do. But they're clear, uh, clearly a massive player, and you know, somebody that we got to continue to keep an eye on, uh, especially to make sure they're playing fair. Um, okay, so let me. I uh, got another one here. So I know food and, and fuel are not considered in inflation. However, it seems the media is adding these items. Um, so when we when we think about that, so there, there's two levels of inflation. You have you have you have basically CPI and you have core CPI. So core is what the Federal Reserve really looks at, and that has food and energy. And the reason why they get rid of those two buckets um, is because they can be very seasonal. They can be based on you know obviously weather weather events, and so they're not considered in the core inflation, uh, but they are considered in just regular inflation. And so when you see inflation numbers uh, by the headlines. Be careful what you're reading because sometimes when you look at um, just you know core uh, uh, when you look at consumer price the consumer price index which is CPI um, they are going to be higher because they are including food and energy and obviously you as an individual as a, especially as a retiree 
uh, you're, you're consuming uh, food, you're consuming fuel. So that's part of your, your, your inflation. Okay, so let me just cross these off. I like it, we're getting questions today. So I feel like we haven't had a lot of questions over the last uh, few webinars. Okay, so which tax line is, is used um, for the $400,000 uh, and so, or at, at, sorry, at 39.6% uh, bracket, excuse me. Um, so they're looking at taxable income. So, I, and I think I maybe have mentioned that earlier, but so that the, the 39.6 bracket, um, I haven't seen if that's actually where, uh, where 39.6 is gonna start. It looks like it's going to, uh, but it will be taxable income. So taxable income, remember, is after your standard deductions, if you're not itemizing, or if you're itemizing, then it would be after like charitable giving, your mortgage interest, your taxes. And so um, that's generally what it is, taxable income. That's how it is now. I'm not sure if that's what it's gonna be, but I'm, I'm fairly certain. The good news, I should have an answer uh, not too far away. So uh, not too far from now. All right, let me just keep clicking through here. Uh, do I feel that the proposed changes in Medicare will not be included in the bill? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, I, I do know that they've been moving the, the surcharges for Medicare in terms of just additional costs to taxpayers, uh, but I haven't seen a lot of specifics on this. But I, I think some of it is because, you know, the reports we're getting back because there isn't something that's passed. There's a lot of the high level stuff. And I haven't read much on, 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 the, on some of these proposed changes that might impact Medicare. I'm certain there's some in there. I just, I don't, I don't know what they, what they are right now. All right. We're moving through, I like this. So what, what should all of us do in terms of strategies on inheritance tax? Well, it's a great question, but it's such a specific indiv individualized question because of you know, if your estate is worth 5 million, that's different than it's worth 10 and it's different than it's worth 20. Um, and it also has to do with your stage in life, right? If you're in your 50s versus your 80s, um, you know, likely we've seen a lot of changes when administrative changes or when administrations change. So my recommendation to you is, you know, when you have a meeting with us, we'll go through some of the strategies, but it is probably reaching out to your estate planning attorney because they're gonna get into the weeds on this and really look through and comb through the, the major estate changes other than just these numbers because there's likely gonna be some other tax changes in there. Um, but it definitely should have a conversation on some of the strategies because I know, you know they are, when, you're, when you go through tax increases or reduction of, or of, of, reduction of like tax, tax write-offs, you're likely gonna see some loopholes getting closed and I don't know what all those are but it's definitely going to be a good conversation. I think the, I don't want to say it's unfortunate, but it's an unfortunate if you, if we have to take action and, and make decisions today, because it looks like it's going to be retroactive back to like maybe September 13th or something. So if you take action today, you might not be able to take advantage of the old, uh, the old laws. And that's going to be potentially a battle normally when we see changes. So when Trump made those changes, he made it in December and they were effective for the next year. So it didn't muddle up that whatever you did in the current tax year, this one has been kind of fight. There's been a lot of fighting around, okay, do we, if we make the changes, are they going to be for next year or are they going to be immediate? And it looks like they might be immediate, which I don't know how the IRS is going to deal with that because it's going to make their job even more complicated, right? If you have one tax structure for 90 days or sorry, you know, 270 days of the, of the year, and then you have um, another tax structure for 95 days of the year. So it's going to be very challenging to see how this is going to get implemented, but we're, we're going to know soon. Um, so I think, again, this is a long-winded answer, so I apologize, but I think it's just be ready to plan and see what you can do. But, you know, I, I don't like when people make hasty decisions because, you know, we'll have changes in presidencies. It'll go to, you know, it'll go from, it'll go from Republican or Democrat to Republican to Democrat. And we've seen that over our history. So probably not going away. I know some of you might debate me on that, on that thought, but um, we're, you're still going to have some opportunities, but the window might be narrowing from some of the estate planning opportunities that you would have currently. All right. Let's see here. This might be my last one. I got one more. Um, if the estate tax exemption is going from 11.7 to 6 million, 
and someone has used up their lifetime gift exemption, well, they still have a $6 million estate exemption. So good question. This is a complicated answer. So I would always defer to your estate planning attorney, but essentially what happened several years back is they unified the gift tax exemption and the estate tax exemption, which basically meant you could give away and use your, you could give away money during your lifetime. And whenever you haven't used would be applied at your death. So if you've already used up your lifetime gift, gift tax exemption, it's likely that you would not have any estate exemption because you've already used up your part. And that's where people were doing planning. They're saying, hey, if it's at 11.7, I'm going to do my gifting now so that if they change it down to 6 million, for example, I've now already utilized that exemption. So if you've already utilized the exemption, to the best of my knowledge, you would not have an additional 6 million because you've already used up in excess of that. But with that caveat, I'm not an attorney, so I would definitely uh, confirm with, uh, with your estate planning attorney. All right, well, thank you for all the great questions. I'm gonna sign off as always. Uh, it's a pleasure being able to host these webinars with you, uh, continue to provide us feedback. That's what we're here to do. And if there's topics that we haven't covered that you want us to do a deeper dive on, please let us know. And again, thank you and have a good night.